Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Bridge to the Past, Art Across U.S. History. I'm your host, Mary Patterson, and today is all about the portrait. Portraits portray their subjects very intentionally. They can be a window not just into the individual, but the bigger time from which they come. Today, we're looking at two portraits of two individuals who are pretty important when you talk about the creation of the United States as a country. So we have our work cut out for us. So I am delighted to have some backup. So with me today is my coworker, the one and only Gary Coletti. Hi, Gary. Hi, what a lovely introduction that was. I feel so elevated. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what your role is on the BRI team. Sure. Uh, well, I was a, a teacher myself that may come up in this conversation, uh, but currently I'm a director of programs. So that means all of the teacher and student programs, whether or not they're in person or online, um, will cross my path at some point. So uh, we, we probably, we interact a lot, you and I, but also you out there, students and others, you may uh, see us in any one of our programs. Right. So we're not teachers technically anymore, but we're still teachers and we're always students. Have that on the brain, have an experience with it, yeah. First and foremost. So Gary, are you ready to look at some portraits? I am. I love doing things like this. It's very exciting. Okay, so let's dive in. Without further ado, we are pleased to present you with A Tale of Two Georges. So we are looking at two portraits of two men, both named George, from the 1700s. So if you've seen us in past Bridge to the Past episodes, you'll know that we are right in the lead up to the American Revolution. So we're still in that general time period, and we're going to start with George number one, King George III, by the artist Johann Zofani, and this was painted in 1771. So we have talked about before that whenever you see a visual primary source, especially a painting and especially a portrait, you really just want to look and observe. Just take in what you see and make some observations and use those observations to start formulating questions. So right off the bat from the title of this, I know it's King George III, and one of my questions is, why isn't he wearing a crown? Right? I mean, you're a king. It would seem like you that's a dead giveaway to be a king is to have a crown on your head, but he doesn't have one. So I wonder what made why he made that choice. And if I again if so there's room to speculate, right? I mean, one, it strikes me to imagine this is not the only portrait of this king then, right? One might imagine that there are some crowned portraits, some formalized ones somewhere. So this sort of might be one of a few. So why that's an excellent question. Why in this particular one? And it would appear that what he is wearing, not a crown, I see a hat. If we're in the purely observational stage here, I see a hat, sword, sash is a table, nice chair. What I would say is a military uniform, but a very formalized one. Um, and so perhaps, and again, if the question was to me or to others, uh, it, it seems to be that observing that there's no crown, but it seems to be highlighting his his military um, responsibilities, would you say? Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's that's another thing that really strikes me about this is the the coat, the sash. This looks like a fancy sort of pin or metal on his chest. So what's what's going on with that? Why is he wearing this uniform? I mean, the chair is very nice. The table is pretty fancy, but the background is pretty uncluttered. It's pretty... Right. Pay no attention to that background. <laughs> Focus on the foreground. Now, and, and I have to say, your question is a good one to me, if I, if I can jump in, is that you, you've, you've called atten my attention the fact that he is actually sitting kind of casually. For if this were, as I said, a military thing, that also probably would seem more formal. This seems very informal. Yeah, he's sort of lounging. He looks comfortable. Yeah? He, yeah. So just, so just some basic questions based on what we're observing here is, why isn't he wearing a crown? What's going on with the uniform? So he has some sort of sash and he has this sword and it looks like a medal or something on his breast. So why was this painted? If he is a king and you, like you said, he's, there are probably other portraits of him. So why this particular one? And who would have seen it? Because that might give us more clues as to why he's depicted in this way. That's a great question of the, let's start with the why, uh, who would have seen this? Do we know where it was, is, is it, was, did it have a specific location that it was for, an event it was for? 
Well, it does. So let me uh, um, let me jump forward. Well, let's let's jump forward to to your question there. So this picture was seen by the public, and it was likely commissioned by the king or the queen or maybe both of them. And it was actually hung in this place called the Royal Academy. And George III actually starts the Royal Academy, which was just this a patronage, basically. He gathered all of these artists, gave them money, royal funds, to create art, and they would display it every year, and the public could come and see it. So he was pretty, I guess, supportive of artists. So this and the Royal Academy is something that goes on even to the present day. And to be, as an artist, to be a member of the Royal Academy is a pretty pretty big deal. And this particular artist, Johann Zafani, was known for presenting subjects sort of as they wanted to be presented. So that sort of gives us an insight in, as, into King George III. He didn't really like pretentiousness. He kind of liked simple things. So even though he is, it's a very ornate table and a pretty snazzy uniform and a very nice chair, for a king, <laughs> pretty simple background. There's no crown. There's no orb and scepter or symbols of like royal power. There's no coronation robe. It's just him in an officer's uniform. And, and that's really interesting. So this is his choice to be, you use the word portrayed this way. And that, um, I think that's interesting, right? So, I mean, I, there may be symbolism in here, right? There may be and by symbolism, I mean like why that particular jacket, um, you know, why it's composed that way. But it's not symbolic the way that one might expect for a, you know, someone reigning. If this is for artists primarily, now you said it was for the public, but artists would be seeing it. That that seems like that's a very distinct choice, perhaps even to these artists to say, like, if you are part of this, then you get the casual version of me by an artist that I hold in some esteem. I mean, it's done very well. I mean, it's a, it's a portrait that having never met King George III, I, I imagine looks very much like him, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and then what's in there is very focused on, on almost the humanity of him, which you're right, is very unusual for a portrait of a king. Right. And I, I think it's, it's also important to, to think about portraits are generally, and certainly in this time period, portraying someone rich or powerful, because it's not to have your portrait painted is a timely, pricey affair. So mm. obviously as a king, he's both rich and powerful. And um, it, it is, you know, a status for the artist being a part of the Royal Academy, being you know, chosen to depict the king. But I think it also, this sort of military uniform and guise as the king, sort of, it almost reflects his the context from which he's coming as well. So this, this quote here, George III, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and so forth. This sort of, <laughs> this is George's official title. The, the so forth is my favorite part. I was gonna say, and so forth is part of that. That's fascinating. So in 1771, he is, he's been the king since, uh, he's been the king for 11 years at this point. He becomes king when he's 22 years old. So he's still fairly wow. young, yeah. 33 in this, picture, he becomes king in the middle of the Seven Years' War. So he comes to power when he's fighting France, basically for world domination. And we talked about the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War on prior episodes, but it was this battle playing out in North American colonies, as well as other places in the world, for who would be supreme, Britain or France. And of course, Britain wins. That was really expensive. And that's when we start seeing the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts and the colonists being taxed to help pay for that cost of the war. And then things just kind of keep escalating from there. So the colonists aren't happy, of course, with the taxes, and they start um, protesting. Troops are sent over. British troops are sent to Boston in 1768, and they would have worn, the officers would have worn a uniform very much like George III is wearing. So this is right in the middle of all these tensions with the colonies, and things are going to escalate from here. So in 1771, we still haven't seen the Boston Tea Party Britain and the American colonies aren't at war yet, but tensions are rising. So I don't know. I think that his choice of being in the military uniform, I mean, his reign in a way is going to be defined by war. He comes to power during a war. He's going to see the American Re Revolutionary War. And then after that, he'll see war again with France. So I think there are still symbols of his power here, but he's sort of, I, I think he kind of looks smug and in control. Like he's calm. Like nothing's phasing him almost. I don't know. I'm speculating. That's so, 
so this is good. This goes back to your very first thing about observation, right? And you had that good list of questions there. Can I zero in on that smug part? Because that that's interesting to me. Is it the body position? Is it his face? What what is it that makes him smug to you? I think it's a little bit of both. Like he doesn't seem nervous at all. He just sort of seems at ease and comfortable and. I'm interpreting that comfort as having confidence. And why wouldn't you be confident if you're 33 years old and you're the king of Great Britain, <laughs> Ireland, defender of the faith and so forth? And so forth. Yeah. You have a lot to be confident about. You're, you mean, you're living large. Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing, right? I mean, exactly like you said, I was thinking the same thing, that the, it's not like what we know the American Revolution coming down, you know, coming down the pike is going to be. He's not new to any kind of conflict. I mean, he starts with it. It seems continuous. So perhaps the whole military thing, like you said, is just, it, it's nothing new for him to be thinking about these these things happening. But then that leads to the whole, he doesn't seem like that smug thing maybe. Sure, conflicts may be happening, but he doesn't seem to think he's losing them or is nervous about them in this particular portrait. At all. Why, why would he be nervous? He is, he is the king of Great Britain. Great Britain has defeated France in the Seven Years' War. They, have, they control a vast amount of territory in the North American colonies. They're, they're encre encroaching even more in India. I mean, they have their presence sort of all over the world. Like, he's, he has no reason to worry, really, right. in 1771. So yeah, so that casual stance in this portrait may not just be that he was tired from sitting for a while, but rather to express things are fine in England. I I think so. I mean, he may he maybe he was tired. I think sitting for portrait. <laughs> imagine. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine you're actually just sitting in your pose, not moving, maybe not talking, maybe making small talk. I'm not sure which of those is worse. Right. But it's it's an involved thing. But I think he. I mean, this was intentional. This was time. This was money. Right, right. Supposed to be portrayed that way. Right, right, right. My, Which leads me to the question about the face and the whole, is that just his resting face? And I guess his resting face is as one of confidence. Yes. I mean, we'll, I guess that's something we'll just, we'll never know if that's his resting face or not. <laughs> if students, if you guys know, or you have a theory, right. about his resting face, please let us know. But let's, let's transition to George number two. Okay. So we are fast forwarding five years in time, it's now 1776, and we have our second George, George Washington, by the American artist Charles Wilson Peale. So once again, we have a portrait of an individual, and we should just observe and try to turn those observations into questions to learn more. Okay, so now having a second one, we can kind of compare and contrast, right? And what we what we knew about this person prior, George III, uh, is that he has been king a little while. Now, this is 1776 for George Washington. Obviously, we know him as extremely famous. The same question I have then about George III, would this be one of a number of portraits of his? Would he have already had, or is this like his debut portrait? Because mm -hmm. you said this is... The war is going on at this point, right? Well, the war is not. The war is going on. Yes, we're in the height of the revolution. Right, height of the war. So he's a known person. It seems very clear why he's dressed in military outfit. Yes, and he has again. He's got his stance is doesn't to me. It doesn't seem as relaxed. <laughs> no, the yes, the the arm on the cane is not. I don't know how you hold that for a while. That, that's, that's extremely awkward, but he also has his hand in his shirt, which is something I, I have seen in other portraits of other men in power. So I'm wondering what's going on with the hand in the shirt. And it again, is. why, where is he? Why is, why was this painted? So like you said, is this, um, is this the first portrait of George Washington? Like why this particular pose? Why this particular time? Who mm -hmm. would have seen this? So these are all good questions to ask as a point of departure. Right. And it's good. Yeah. And I'm glad you've, you've given, oh, look, you're going right to context, which was my, my question. So, you know, again, he's, he's important enough to have a portrait taken, taken. It's not like it's a photograph, just to sit for a portrait. Um, but uh, you mentioned like location, the background is very different. This is not just wallpaper or anything like this. What's the significance of the background? Right. It looks like, you know, it's, it's a specific, it looks like a specific place versus the chair. So again, if we're situating ourselves in time, so we're a few years beyond 
where we were with King George III. So the Boston Tea Party has happened. And now, so tensions keep escalating between the colonies and Great Britain. We've actually had shots fired at Lexington and Concord. And then the British army is sieging Boston. So George Washington is then appointed commander of a continental army because there's fighting actually happening out in Boston. They need a leader. He's appointed mm. commander in 1775. He frees Boston. And there's actually a the sort of a last ditch effort to avoid a full on war with the olive branch petition. So Congress sends a letter to King George III saying, you know, we don't want this to actually become a war. King George III doesn't even read it. Wow. No, you are an open rebellion. So the war has started and they're actually, as George Washington is sitting for this portrait, they are, the Continental Congress is drafting the Declaration of Independence. So you have Washington as the commander with Boston in the background and the war is really just starting and it's a huge question mark. I mean, the, we, the American colonies are taking on the British Empire. Yeah. So it is not a foregone conclusion that the United States, well, the colonies are going to win. Right. And yet there's enough confidence in Washington to say, let's get a portrait of him showing liberated Boston. Right. Well, let me go back. I'll go back into this audience. So this is, um, it was actually commissioned by John Hancock, who was a Boston resident and president of the Continental Congress. And it was, a, uh, so he's, Washington is appointed commander and he's, Hancock wants to of course, recognize him as a leader, but also he's thankful to Boston for, he's thankful to Washington for freeing Boston as he's a pretty wealthy resident there. He had a lot of property there. So of course he wanted the British out. So all of these things sort of play into why he's depicted the way he is. And just the, the hand in the shirt is actually something that goes back to ancient Greece and mm. portraitures were depicted this way. And it was supposed to at around Washington's time in American and British portraits, reflect uh, leadership and calm and confidence. So if someone saw this in the 1770s, they would say, oh, okay, this is like power pose. Even we are just kind of like, that looks awkward with his cane, but this was actually supposed okay. to reflect his, his leadership and his confidence. So comparing this to the, the, the prior portrait, they, they both are seeking to, look at that, they both are seeking to exhibit leadership and confidence and things are fine, Don't worry. we've got this covered, but they're actually on completely opposite sides of that. So they both are saying, don't worry, we're not going to lose this to the people, hopefully, who are probably seeing this portrait. Right. When I think that there's a lot of interesting comparisons between these two men. So obviously they're living at the same time. They have the same name, but they, they had a lot of things in common. I think they were both very determined. So Washington was determined to like see through the cause of American independence. So he leads the Continental Army for eight long years. And it's just, I mean, it's a ragtag Mm -hmm. underdog army for sure but he he really holds it together and king george iii also hangs on to this idea of i'm not letting these colonies go and he actually considers abdicating rather than officially acknowledging that they're going to leave so they sort of had these similar traits but it's sort of interesting how events unfold and the differences between them you know one inherits power one is elected to power and leaves power he leaves his um the army as a leader which nobody can believe that he does right like everyone's sort of expecting another julius caesar episode to happen and then he leaves the presidency after two terms so really kind of remarkable decisions that even impressed king george the third yeah and that was gonna be my my question too but i i guess it's fairly clear that you know you can often compare portraits but these two men were probably very well aware of each other Yes, yes, they were. And I think um, there's this wonderful quote that when, it, it can't be traced, but I, I've seen it in several places that when King George III hears that Washington has resigned power and is going back home to his farm to Mount Vernon, he says, well, if he does that, he'll be the greatest man who ever lived. Like he just <laughs> can't believe that he would leave power like that. An American Cincinnatus, as they say. So yeah, and one is sort of remembered as, you know, this, this king who went mad. He had, uh, he had a condition that, that was interpreted as madness, but that's really not what it was. And the other is sort of revered as the father of our country. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they were both family men. They both like farming. Um, they both were sort of self-conscious about their learning. George III didn't learn to read until he was almost 11 years old. So they had a lot of things, small things in common, but sort of the 
their role on the world stage kind of took them down different paths. So it's kind of fun to see them side by side. It is. One wonders what would have happened had they met. Yes, that's an excellent question. If you can think of a good short act play as to how, <laughs> what happens when George III meets George Washington, you, you've got to let us know. Yeah. But we are, we are out of time here on uh. to the Past, so we are going to have to say goodbye and thank you. And remember, whether you're posting something on Instagram or Twitter, whatever it is, you are portraying yourself very intentionally. So think about, what is this going to say about me? And how might others interpret this? Just, you know, one of those timeless questions. They were asking it in 1776 and we ask it today. So if you like this video, if you learned something, be sure to like this video, subscribe. We've got lots of other things to help you in the school year ahead. So thanks again. Okay. All right, thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Bye, thanks Gary.